Hi there, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Mr. Schwenk. Welcome to another episode of Cleo's Corner U.S. History. Today, we're leaving our East Coast history behind and setting out on a journey westward into what has been described as the United States' first colony. The American West has always held a special place in the American psyche. It's a land of freedom and individualism and man versus nature, as industrious Americans prove that we can tame even the planet itself. Also, for a country that was born hugging the eastern coast of the continent, moving west was about the only option, especially after we failed to move north into Canada during the War of 1812, and we finished moving south into Florida. The west uh, has changed its definition over time. In the colonial era, the west meant the Appalachian Mountains. After the Revolutionary War, the west was everything between the mountains and the Mississippi River. When we say Northwest today, we typically think of the Pacific Northwest with its scenic mountains, Seattle's Space Needle, copious amounts of rain, and if you're a certain age, grunge rock. When we think of the Southwest, you might imagine arid landscapes, uh, Pueblo dwellings, and the Grand Canyon. However, Long before Americans were even aware of these areas, Indiana was the center of the Old Northwest, and Alabama and Mississippi were considered the Southwest. It was not until the mid-1800s that Americans really started paying attention to the land west of the Mississippi. There were several reasons for this change uh, in focus, and the essential question that we're exploring in this video is, how did American ideas about manifest destiny influence how people settled the West? It's also important to note that the process of westward migration lasts about a century, depending on where you mark the start and finish of it. At its most broad definition, we could say that the Lewis and Clark exploration of it in 1804 was the first push into the American West. However, no real attempt at settling the, the, the land took place back then. Other, others will place westward expansion at the creation of the Monroe Doctrine, essentially claiming the Americas for the United States. This is also the first event that we can point to that makes the argument that the settlement of the American West was, in essence, a colonization effort. So what does being a colony mean? Well, typically, a colony is a region that does not have political independence, uh, that exists to provide resources or living space for a parent country. Colonies also typically are later additions to the parent country and have little say whether or not they are made into a colony. Historically, you can make the argument that colonies do not place a high regard for the native inhabitants of the land, and they also oftentimes have a very different living conditions than the parent country. Lastly, we often think of colonies as being physically distant from the parent country. That would make the American West unique, and we can explore that also. It's worth mentioning that the Western expansion, that Western expansion, it, it's a process. It was still incomplete by the Civil War, which is where this course ends. In fact, it's not until after the Civil War that some of the more recognizable moments of Western exp expansion, like cowboys and wagon trains and trains themselves and the Indian Wars took place. What we're concentrating on today is the why of exploration and sort of how it gets started. So this isn't the entire story of Western expansion. It's only the start. In our last episode, we focused on Andrew Jackson and his presidency. We ended that discussion by outlining several effects of his time in office, namely the bank wars. The bank wars led to the end of the second national bank and the creation of so-called pet banks. The effect of not having a unified national monetary policy was riskier lending and financial panic. So after the economic panic of 1830s, Americans began to see the West as a place of opportunity and escape from financial burdens. Keeping in mind that the eventual destination of many of these earliest settlers, like Texas and California, 
was not U.S. territory. It still belonged to Mexico. So although generations of Americans grew up playing the Oregon Trail, westward expansion was more than just packing up your family onto a wagon and hopefully not dying of dysentery. In fact, it was a series of routes with different endpoints and going for different reasons. Each of these journeys had their own specific set of dangers. One consistent belief through much of early American history is the idea that Americans had a special purpose in the world. This belief of American exceptionalism has its roots all the way back in the Puritan ideals of Massachusetts, but had also grown and developed to believe that it was our duty to spread American values and our way of life across the American continent. So this was a concept that predates newspaper editor John O'Sullivan, who is credited with coining the phase Manifest Destiny in the, 19, in the 1840s. Manifest Destiny is not a name or a title, however. It's just a phrase that he used to describe an idea using overly complex language styles of the time. The word manifest simply means obvious. So what, o what O'Sullivan was trying to say is that stopping our expansion at the Rocky Mountains would never be enough. It is manifest or it's obvious that our destiny was to control all of the land between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. Like I said, this was a idea that had begun the moment we started pushing into um, you know, the, the, over the Appalachian mountains into the West, uh, the idea of manifest destiny, however, was not really started until the 1840s, which coincidentally coincided with the outbreak of the war with Mexico, who just happened to own the land that we were obviously supposed to control. More simply put, having oceans on both sides of us places a natural barrier to attack. A land border is far less secure. So controlling everything between these two oceans would give us a blanket of security from potential attackers. There were also extremely valuable resources in the West that America needed. Again, if we revisit this idea of the West as a colony, many Americans moved into Texas and Oregon and California to escape overcrowding and poor quality of life in the East. And the kinds of things that they would be producing in the West were products that would be consumed in the East, like beef and grain and minerals. So how did this process get started? Several factors drew Americans westward. Since before the revolution, there had been hunters and trappers who ventured into the wilderness to gather furs and natural resources in areas that were not settled by whites. You might remember us talking about Daniel Boone in, a, in an earlier uh, episode, earlier unit. It was conflict over use of land west of the Appalachian Mountains that sparked the French and Indian War, and it started the road to revolution. Some of the first Americans west of the Mississippi were exactly these men, these mountain men, who set off either individually by themselves or in companies of men to hunt and gather resources. These men lived off of the land. They had a very close connection to the natural environment. And they, they blazed the very first paths, the physical paths that others would follow. They also blazed paths with relations with natives. Those relations were certainly not always positive, but typically Native Americans were happy to trade resources so long as the mountain men respected their lands and boundaries and didn't try to settle on the land. These mountain men enter into folk history. They become popular heroes of the time. Men like Jim Bridger, 
Jedediah Smith, Kit Carson, James Grizzly Adams, and Hugh Glass. Um, these are men that, uh, that become a new generation of Americans that fit the model of the rugged American individual uh, moving into uncivilized land and making it, um, making it safe for, for our development. They come back with fantastic stories. Uh, Hugh Glass there with the bear and the knife um, is he, his story was made into a popular movie recently with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio called The Revenant, if you've ever seen that. Uh, Jedediah Smith. Um, had some very unique facial scars from a bear attack that uh, literally ripped uh, his entire scalp off from, from his uh, ear all the way to the opposite ear, uh, just lifted the flap right up and over his head. Uh, the men thought he had died. Uh, he was unconscious before he woke up and um, uh, called for, for some, some uh a string and a needle and thread and 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 he took his entire hair and flipped it back over the top of his head and sewed it up. So these are these are truly rugged individuals, men who um, uh, you know started a, a, a path um, that that others were going to follow within the next few decades. Another early group of American immigrants were the Mormons. They were, they were a religious group started by Joseph Smith in the 1820s during a period of American history that we sort of skipped over, but uh, it was called the Second Great Awakening. Um, the, typically, new religious movements tend to be controversial, and they continued to move westward uh, looking for uh, places where they could sort of worship in peace, and, and they never quite figured it out. They moved from New York to Ohio, and then Illinois, and finally Missouri, um, and, and finally said, to heck with it, we're, we're going out to where, you know, we can be, uh, we can live our own lives, and, and made a major move to what is now Utah. There they established the city of Salt Lake City and lived independently until the late 1800s when they sort of rejoined the United States. Many immigrants relied on the trails that they maintained and trading posts that they had along the way to restock on supplies. There was an increasing sense of adventure and opportunity in the West. While many Americans took routes to Oregon, Many others headed for established Spanish towns in California and Texas. These early settlers would have been little more than squatters and illegal immigrants on Mexican land. But the Mexican government was extremely insecure and had very little desire to stop these new arrivals. In fact, Texas immigrants were conveniently... Um, a, uh, a useful barrier to Comanche Indian attacks. The Comanche were some of the most brutal and efficient native groups in the West, and they very often would raid Ameri uh, rather uh, uh, Mexican plantations by allowing Americans to settle on Texas land that was less productive than the, the land further south in Mexico. The Mexicans provided the Comanches with a more convenient target, uh, the more tempting target. So as as uh, as more Americans came in, the Comanches would would attack the more the much closer uh, Texas immigrants rather than moving south uh, to attack the, uh, the the Mexicans. The Northern Territories in Mexico of Texas and what was called Alta California um, were, uh, were, were not very um, well developed and, and were very sparsely populated. And so moving people in was actually, you know, at least in the minds of Mexicans, good for the territory. But it was... Um, it wasn't very long, however, that the American immigrants outnumbered the Mexicans that lived there. 
And pretty soon, the Americans that lived there, the immigrants that lived there, um, took took uh, um, offense at or didn't like the rules and living under the regulations of the Mexican government. And so um, uh, they began to rebel. And in the 1840s, uh, the, the Texans began that process and rebelled um, in, in a war for independence. Uh, the, the Texas War for Independence is, is probably better known than the Californian War for Independence. They also fought a short conflict called the Bear Flag Rebellion, but it was also, that rebellion was also being fought with and as part of the larger Mexican-American War, so sometimes it just kind of gets grouped in with that. Uh, and it's why they we kind of know the Texan War, uh, the earlier Texan uh, Independence War, better than than the the Bear Republic, uh, the Bear Flag Rebellion. Probably the most iconic moment in the Texan Independence must be the tragic events at the Alamo, a former Spanish mission where Texan families had gathered for protection. Uh, it was the death of the Alamo defenders, including some notable Americans such as Davy Crockett and Jim Bowie and Colonel Travis, that wind up inspiring other Texans to to win the war. Eventually, Texas would be allowed to join the United States, but tensions between the U.S. and Mexico would continue to run high as President Polk now set his sights on the rest of California and the West. The Mexican-American War that followed led to Mexico losing the northern half of their country in what was called the Mexican Secession. So just to kind of give you a little bit of a graphic here, if we're talking about America up to this point, um, you know, you've got the the sort of the original part of America that uh, had had been um, as, whoop, not, not uh, Florida down there. Uh, the kind of the original part of America uh, um, uh, that we won during the revolution. Then you added the um, the Louisiana Territory. Right. Uh, with with uh, President Jefferson. Uh, So now that is part of the United States. Then we can add to that Florida during the Jackson administration, okay? And uh, now you have uh, an independent, it's important to remember that, that Texas was its own country. It had its own Um, uh, it had its own president, uh, in, in Sam Houston, right. And, and it was, was its own country before it then applied and became, and was annexed into the United States, uh, after the Mexican American war. But what we really would like is now we already claimed, we had already claimed along with, uh, Britain, uh, the Oregon territory and president Polk. Uh, signed an agreement that the Oregon Territory actually extended north into what is today Canada, but they made an agreement with the British to split it along the uh, and establish that northern border. Uh, so we got the southern half of the Oregon Territory. So really, what um, uh, the, uh, the the last piece that we really needed to complete our manifest destiny was this Alta California section here. Um, and that was what was the, the, uh, the Mexican uh, secession uh, really was all about, right? The last piece that, the last little bit that we wind up getting uh, is what's called the Gadsden Purchase. And um, that was uh, a little bit more land purchased from Mexico a little bit later. And oddly enough, Gadsden has come into our story before um, because when Gadsden was a young lieutenant, he took place in the, um, the massacre I was telling you about uh, on, at the, uh, the British fort. Uh, the, 
in during the uh, the beginning of the Seminole War, um, or one of the Seminole Wars. So. Um, At any rate, technically, um, you know, the Mexican secession, that's a huge piece. It forms what is today California, Nevada, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico. Technically, the United States paid $15 million, which is a little less than half a billion in today's dollars. They, technically, they paid $15 million for the land after the war. Uh, but it was land that the Mexicans were being forced to sell because we had just wiped the floor with them militarily. And really, we didn't actually even pay them for it. We just gave them a credit on the money that they already owed us as part of their national debt. So really, it was just us saying that we would pay them. So it didn't look like we just straight made a land grab against a weaker neighbor, which is exactly what we did. But hey, if we hadn't, where would our celebrities live if we didn't have California? And in just a few years, in just a few years later, in 1848, after the war, gold was found at a sawmill owned by John Sutter, starting the California Gold Rush. In the span of about a year, an estimated 300,000 Americans relocated to California, which I think had a population of like. Uh, 45,000 across the entire state, um, not to mention the numbers of Chinese um, uh, immigrants, Mexican immigrants, and immigrants from other European countries uh, to the United States to try their luck at getting rich. California boomed overnight from being sort of um, uh, empty to having their governor uh, or a, a senator, rather, uh, John Fremont, um, uh, become a presidential candidate. Uh, so oddly, much of the American West, which was the Louisiana Territory and what we would call the Great Plains today, was really skipped over. Um, America was settled uh, on the East Coast and on the West Coast for a uh, second, and then, and then we sort of march slowly into the middle. And that's really because, like I said, geographically, it's a hard place to live on. Trees and water are really scarce out there. And so the way that you could live in the East with, in log cabins and having easy access to uh, water resources because of the various rivers, um, you really have to adapt to a very different lifestyle. And so pioneers didn't choose to settle on the land. Um, those that did eventually choose to live on the land lived in a very different sort of way. They found land was very cheap. It was very good for um, farming and raising cattle. Um, However, it, it, like I said, though, it required some different uh, methods to, to, uh, to live. You lived in sod houses, so literally just sort of like, you know, mud brick uh, and um, uh, loose brick, uh, loose mud homes. Um, you had uh, a, a much more open and moving society later on with the cowboys uh, in the big open ranges where cattle could graze. Um, however, there were also some extremely important things to consider before taking off on your journey west. There were many dangers uh, if you were going to move out west, including storms, uh, animals, and running out of supplies. Uh, immigrants on the Oregon Trail wrote about seeing the wreckage of caravans and wagons that did not survive the journey. Uh, traveling this trail meant that others had gone before you. You had to get water from sources where others may have previously polluted it. So diseases like cholera were major killers. And medicines were not regulated, so oftentimes they were just as dangerous as the disease, or they might be completely ineffective. 
there were plenty of inaccurate maps and new dangers never faced before in the east, so getting lost or stuck in the mountains in the wintertime was a real threat. While natives were typically tolerant of individual mountain men violating their space, the now constant stream of settlers was more than they were willing to accept, and conflicts became more and more frequent. The Dawes Act in 1887 ended the policy of treating native nations as sovereign independent groups and transferred Indian relations from the State Department, whose job it is to handle relations with other nations, to the War Department. So it was pretty clear what our policy would be to natives. As Western expansion put pressure on natives, they responded with force, and so did the United States Army. Natives would be continually fought, removed, and placed on ever-shrinking reservations. Lastly, when you immigrated west, you were in essence falling off the grid. You were outside the reach of people who could help you out of situations. You either survived or you died. It was a very steep learning curve to take a family with young kids into. Many times, men would take the journey first, set up a life, and then send for the family afterwards. Oftentimes, the husband or father simply never returned. Immigrating westward was not a task that people took lightly. So, just to wrap up, let's take another look at our question about the West being the United States' first colony. While the western half of North America is physically connected to the eastern half, it was not originally part of the United States. It was not a part of the original colonies or the plan of our founders. The west was an addition. It was forcibly taken from both the natives who rightfully lived there and the Mexican government who claimed it as well. It didn't have a choice to join. It was claimed by us. It was a source of gold, silver, copper, grain, and cattle that was consumed in the East. The population of the Americans uh, settled, the population of, the, <laughs> the population, let's try this again. The population um, in America uh, often settled there looking for escape from the pressures of living in the East. And living in the West required a different type of lifestyle based on different geographical pressures and available resources. So the debate continues, and there is no one right answer other than to say that the history of the United States would look very different if expansion had not occurred. Thanks for watching. See you on our next episode.